Hi there, thanks for watching. My name is Alex Clark. I'm a first year PhD student at Cornell University and my field of study is plant pathology. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing a little bit with you about my research that I've gotten started on here at Cornell. So my interest lies in the biology and the transmission capabilities of Spicistilus festinus, an insect which is the vector of grapevine red watch virus. So, the U.S. wine industry is a fairly important agricultural market for the U.S. Uh, it is valued at $62.2 billion uh, and is growing every year. And you can see that some of the biggest markets are California, uh, the Pacific Northwest, and New York, which is where I'm at here at Cornell. So this, this is a large industry and any disease threats to grapes can have a major impact on the industry. One of those threats is grapevine red blotch virus. Uh, this is a virus that was identified uh, just a handful of years ago uh, and has since spread and been found uh, in all of the major wine growing areas of the US. You can see over here, California, the Pacific Northwest, New York, uh, all those big, big wine growing areas, as well as other areas with smaller wine production. And the impacts that it's had so far are fairly significant uh, due to the fact that grapevines that get this virus, they develop red blotch disease, uh, after which the virus has been named. And these infected plants, uh, the berries that they grow have uneven or reduced ripening, uh, and as well as lower sugars and anthocyanins. So they can't really be used to make wine. And that means that the wine growers have to rip those vines out. Uh, you can see here some different wine varietals and the effects that you can see or the symptoms that you can see. Uh, you, this distinctive red blotching is fairly common on red varietals, red grape varietals such as Syrah or Pinot Noir. Uh, but on white varietals like Chardonnay, you might not see any symptoms or you might see this yellowing uh, intervenal chlorosis. And the price tag that uh, vineyard managers have to face when they see this disease in a vineyard are pretty high. Anywhere from 5,000 to nearly $170,000 per acre of vineyard, depending on the initial disease incidence. So that's, that's a lot of money out of somebody's pocket. You can see here a picture of a Cabernet Franc vineyard. Uh, I mentioned the uneven ripening and that's pretty, pretty apparent here. You can see that these berries are much, much less ripe, uh, have a lower anthocyanin content than the healthy berries over here. So what do we know about grapevine red blotch virus? We know that it is a novel Gemini virus. So it's in the family of Gemini viruses, um, but it belongs to a new genus called Grablovirus, or named after grapevine red blotch. Uh, and it is a single-stranded circular DNA genome virus, like like most, uh, like other G Gemini viruses. Uh, Gemini virus family is very large. There are over 440 viruses globally. These are phloem limited, so they're only gonna be found in the phloem or the vascular tissue of the plants. And in general, they have a twinned or geminate uh, icosahedral coat around them. So they, two little balls next to each other. Uh, some other major economic impacting uh, or agriculturally important Gemini viruses are African cassava mosaic virus, maize streak virus, and tomato yellow leaf curl virus. So my interest with grapevine red blotch virus or GRBV is in the spread of the virus. So initially a lot of the spread happened from nurseries putting out infected plant material across the US but we've seen secondary spread within vineyards uh, where they planted positive vines from a nursery and then it continued to spread in the field. And there are a couple different methods by which grape viruses can spread depending on the insect vector or the vector. For example, grapevine leaf roll associated viruses typically spread along the rows like you can see here, uh, and that's because they're spread by mealybugs, which are little tiny or scale insects. So these, these crawl along the vines and spread the infection laterally. Uh, whereas Nipah viruses, like grapevine fan leaf virus, uh, these are distributed in small foci that spread out. And that is because these are 
transmitted by nematodes. So nematodes will be in low-lying areas and they'll slowly spread it out in a, in a concentric pattern. However, for grapevine ripplot fires, we're seeing a different pattern from either of these. We're seeing the spread out pattern of individual plants in the middle of healthy plants becoming infected. So this is consistent with a new type of vector for the grapevine virus. And the vector that has been uh, put forward is this guy right here, the Spacistilus festinus or the three-cornered alfalfa hopper. Uh, I'll refer to it as Tika from here on out. Uh, Tika is a membracid or a tree hopper. And this is this is it right here. And there's been there's been one study by Bader et al. 2016 that showed that grapevine red blotch virus can be transmitted by Tika in a greenhouse setting. Uh, Tika has also been shown by a other graduate student in our lab uh, to be spatially associated in a vineyard. So there's a vineyard that we collaborate out uh, collaborate with out in Napa Valley in California. And you can see here that we have spread of the virus uh, kind of started here in the field and spread outwards. And that when we do put out sticky cards to capture insects in the field, we see them being distributed in a very similar pattern uh, spatially to the, the way the virus is spreading over a few years. Uh, however, this is kind of interesting. Uh, Tika, they are phloem feeders, and so it makes sense that they would transmit a phloem limited virus like grapevine red blotch virus, but they're not typically a pest of grapes. They're actually more commonly a pest of legumes like peanuts and alfalfa, uh, and so they're actually a pest uh, in the southeast US where those crops are grown. They're, they don't really like grape that much. Uh, they'll feed on it, but they won't complete a life cycle growing on it. So that's a little interesting. Uh, Beyond that, we don't really know much. Uh, for example, we don't know the route by which the virus is being uh, transmitted. There's, for, for insects transmitted viruses, there are several different routes that, can, that the virus can take. They can either be retained in the stylet or the mouth parts of the insect uh, and essentially just sit there and then come right back out when they go to feed again. Uh, they can be retained in the foregut or the, the beginning part of the insect digestive tract. and from there again be spit back out or they can be circulative so they can travel through the whole insect back to the salivary glands where then they will be spit out again uh, and they can either replicate in the insect or not replicate in the insect depending on the virus. Uh, Gemini viruses are typically circulative so typically they would come in go all the way through the gut system get into the hemolymph then go into the salivary glands to be spit out. But uh, this is not something that we know for sure for red blotch virus. So we've been testing that by several different methods. Um, one of the methods that I've been working on recently is uh, studying the transmission uh, in a greenhouse or in a growth chamber setting. Similarly, we, we've tried to replicate what was done in the previous paper and not have much luck with that. So we're trying new things uh, such as these detached leaf assays in which we will take nymphs or uh, the, the earlier than adult stage insects, put them on healthy or infected vines, let them grow to be adults, then take those adults and transfer them over onto a detached grape leaf, and a healthy grape leaf. Uh, we'll put about nine insects per leaf and leave that on there for a few days. Uh, Hopefully they'll spit the virus out into the leaf and then we'll leave the leaf for a while, let the virus replicate before we use quantitative PCR to detect it. However, we have not had so much luck with that so far, but we're trying new things. We're trying different amounts of time for the various steps because uh, this is a new vector system and we don't know. We need to optimize it. But uh, if we're able to work it out, there's a lot of things we can look at. Uh, we, beyond confirming the route of transmission through that assay and others, uh, we can also work on determining the transmission rate because that's something else we don't know. We don't know how, how often the insects transmit the virus when they're feeding. And we can examine some subpopulation uh, differences in in transmission or see if there are any. Uh, for example, seeing if there's differences between 
the three-cornered alfalfa hoppers we're seeing out in California and the ones that are known to be pests in the south. This would be something that would be interesting and could potentially be applied to management recommendations. Uh, then something that I'm particularly interested in is investigating the effects of endosymbiotic bacteria on transmission. So why would I be interested in that? Uh, Phloem feeders, uh, such as the three-cornered alfalfa hopper, they typically have obligate endosymbiotic bacteria. So these are bacteria that live in a specialized organ somewhere usually in the abdomen of the insect, and they will synthesize essential amino acids and other nutrients for the insect. Uh, they'll, they'll live with it throughout its life cycle. And they can have some effects on the, the how long the insects live and their reproduction rate. So these are a potential target for control um, since the symbiotic bacteria are specific to the insect they're in. Uh, if you're able to target that and kill the insects, then you're going to not be affecting your beneficial insects that would have different symbiotic bacteria. Uh, there's been a couple different systems where people are trying this, uh, including in weevils um, or using these bacteria to control uh, nematodes actually, uh, human nematodes that are implicated in human disease. Uh, additionally, endosymbiotic bacteria have been implicated in the transmission of plant viruses. So they, they've been shown to increase viral uptake, retention and transmission, or alter the probing behavior, how often the insects feed, um, as well as modulating the defense responses, which could influence transmission of a virus weakening the plant's immune system, essentially. But very little is known about the endosymbiotic bacteria of tree hoppers. Uh, there's only been two studies, uh, and they, they've only covered two species out of over 3,500 species of tree hoppers that exist, or are known so far. Uh, one of those is Antilia carinata, which is shown here. It's a fairly recent study uh, where they sequenced the endosymbionts, um, as well as this and Canopa permutata uh, from 2013. Uh, both of them appeared to have Candidata socia mulleri um, as the primary endosymbiont, but it's unknown. It, it's potential that this is the same primary endosymbiont that would be in Tika, but it is not known uh, for sure. And it could easily be that there's different secondary endosymbionts than what they found here, uh, as well as sometimes there's facultative endosymbionts that are not in every insect in a population. And those would be ones that are more likely to affect virus transmission. Uh, and actually, uh, Antilia carinata and Spisistilus festinus are in the same subfamily. So uh, currently I've been working as well on identifying the endosymbiotic bacteria in Tika. And I've been doing this by sequencing. Uh, so I dissected bacteriomes, which are the specialized organs which house the endosymbiotic bacteria, uh, followed up with Illumina sequencing uh, and bioinformatics to identify. And I'm currently in, in the process of doing that. Uh, a third uh, area of interest for me, uh, this is something that I've been planning to do starting soon, uh, which is to study the mortality and reproduction of Tika on wild grapevines. So you may remember I showed you a vineyard earlier. Uh, around that same vineyard and in other spots in California, we have observed grapevine red blotch virus in wild grapevines. This is in addition to the commercial grapes across the US that have been found to have red blotch virus. So my interest is in studying uh, whether the Tika can reproduce on wild vines since it has been shown previously, uh, 2018, that the insects will lay their eggs on Vitis vinifera or commercial vines, uh, but the insects do not reach it, uh, maturity. They will essentially fall off the vines. Uh, so what I would like to do is compare alfalfa to commercial grapevine to Vitis californica, which is a wild grapevine, and I will take adult insects uh, in groups of 40 and put them on each of these plants. I expect that they will lay eggs on the alfalfa and the Vitis vinifera. However, for alfalfa, uh, 
we know that they will reach the first instar, second instar, and carry on with their development all the way back to adult. Uh, and we know that with Vitis vinifera, after the second instar, the insects will drop off the plants and die. Uh, but we don't really know what could go on with Vitis californica. So that's something I'll be trying out soon and looking at. Because essentially this, this turns, turns out to be a fairly complicated system. You know, you have an insect, you have grapevines, you have a virus, and you have endosymbiotic bacteria. And we know how some of these interact a little bit, but there's still a lot of big questions out there. So it gives me something to do for my PhD. <laughs> and with that, I thank you for listening. And I thank the members of my lab and the members of my committee for their support and my funding, of course. So thank you for listening. I hope I was able to teach you a little bit about a grape virus. <laughs>